preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, good evening, and welcome to our Sunday evening lecture series. My name is Susan Engel, and I direct the Adult Division in the Center for Adult Life and Learning. So glad to see so many of you with us on this cold winter evening. Uh, before I introduce tonight's guest, I want to let you know about some other programs that I'm sure you won't want to miss. On April 28th, we will be having a discussion on women in the theater with Wendy Wasserstein, Anna DeVere Smith, and Graziele Danielle. And then in May, uh, Henry Louis Gates will be in conversation with Robert Krolwich. And also in May, we will um, be presenting Police Chief Willie Williams from Los Angeles. And on March 17th, Lester Thoreau will be joining us. So I encourage you to buy your tickets in advance to ensure your admission. And now for tonight. It's my pleasure to welcome back to the 92nd Street Y, a writer extraordinaire whose criticism and reviews have received critical acclaim. For many years, he was a jazz critic and staff writer for The Village Voice. Currently, he is a contributing editor to The New Republic, a Sunday columnist for The New York Daily News, and is artistic consultant for jazz programming at Lincoln Center. His collection of essays and reviews, Notes of a Hanging Judge, was nominated for an award in criticism by the National Book Critics Circle and was selected by the Encyclopedia Britannica yearbook as the best book of essays published in 1990. In 1993, he was the recipient of both the Jean Stein Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and a MacArthur Foundation grant. His most recent book and the topic of his talk this evening is The All-American Skin Game or The Decoy of Race. After his talk, he'll be glad to answer your questions on any topic and area of interest and also books will be on sale following the program and we invite you to join us in the back for a social with refreshments. Currently, he is working on a biography of Charlie P Parker and an epic novel called First Snow in Kokomo. He is also writing the scripts for an eight-part television miniseries entitled Jazz, the Music, the People, the Myth. An original and creative thinker who is definitely his own person, always stimulating to listen to Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stanley Crouch. Thank you, thank you. Um, what I think I actually want to do is I have uh, this paper that I'm supposed to deliver somewhere else in a few days. And um, I mean, it's on the same general topics, you know. You know, uh, black people, white people, America, uh, politics, etc. So, I, what, I, what I think I'm going to do is, I think I'm going to read this, and uh, then I'll take questions. Duke Ellington used to do this, you know. He would uh, have an assignment, like you write a piece for the Monterey Jazz Festival or something. And along the way, he would pull different pieces of it out and play it and see what the audience thought. He said, take that part out. So what you're going to hear now is something that no one yet has heard. Uh, it's called Blues to be Redefined. It starts out with a little epigraph. Do not blaspheme. It is the gods who weep. They have watched us killing each other since the beginning of time. They cannot save us from ourselves. Ron, Akira Kurosawa's variation on King Lear. Part one, how you like me now. A long overture in black and white, 
in seared flesh and spilled blood. Things have become so chaotic, or so apparently chaotic, that we might sometimes think that we live not in the United States, but in France. Sleazemongers, from the world of politics all the way over to our public entertainments, symbolize our national ills and our difficulties with perceiving ourselves as a whole nation, the many who make the one, the rich set of improvisations and traditions that are so easily recognized as American by anyone from outside this country. The very complex interplay between politics and society, each influencing the other only as fast as attitudes become digestible, demands that we address something about speed and our sensibility. Once ideas have become platitudes or slogans that soak up enough emotion to affect what happens in voting booths, we see how things too often work in our society. Don't tread on me. Remember the Alamo? Tippecanoe and Tyler too? Have evolved into what we now call the sound bite. One of our most serious problems, however, is that our difficulties are far too complicated to fit into an era demanding that all messages take no longer than a commercial break. Far too intricate to be explained clearly to an audience interested in hearing little more than two or three sentences, which is supposed to function like some sort of an auditory bailing wire capable of holding the protean heap of American blues in place long enough for the mythic garbage trucks of our nation to haul them away. But swirling through all this political and intellectual fast food is a set of manifestations that says much about the condition of the American soul as it relates to the issue of rethinking the Western tradition in terms of politics and society in our world. Tradition, I would like first to look at some of them. <coughs> I would first like to look at some of them and then turn to what I consider our per perpetual American reserves those evergreen ideas and impulses that have allowed us to make it this far and will surely help us to get beyond where we are now. We find ourselves looking at a terrain on which Louis Farrakhan comes close to draining all political, social, and moral seriousness from Afro-American affairs as he stands in Washington, D.C., before perhaps a million men to whom he explains what the icons and numbers on dollar bills supposedly mean. The multitudinous audience for his lunatic numerology and incoherence made possible by an organizing apparatus extending so far outside of his racist cult that it includes churches and sororities. The exceeding bulk of that network of organizations was probably introduced to Farrakhan by Benjamin Chavis, a skirt-chasing minister and sanctimonious hustler whose Christianity took a back seat to his affection for demagoguery and whose fumblings and fondlings during his brief position as executive director of the NAACP nearly brought the organization to ruin, its concern for integration almost incinerated by racial animus. Our American press, ever paternalistic and given to treating Negro Americans as though they are never more than savages shaking hoodoo dolls at the heavens, looked upon the Million Man March as some sort of grand moment or at least one that could be condescended to with the kind of talk about unity and self-esteem that was reminiscent of the antebellum barrels of molasses passed out to the slaves at the end of a good season. But there is something amiss in our country when so many fairly well-off black people seeking some sort of unity as an answer to the ravages of urban life gather around the ineloquent briar patch of Farrakhan's lingo which can include stories about his own space travel and claims from his minions that the Nation of Islam has developed a cure for AIDS, snake oil and racial paranoia in one package. At the other end of the field, but actually right next to Farrakhan, is Patrick J. Buchanan, who is trying to become the Tom Watson of his time, a vulgar populist whose appeal is to every veiled and unveiled form of xenophobia troubling the soul of our country. It is equally true, as one writer said of Buchanan, 
that he is part of a phenomenon that has spread its bile across the stretch of our mass communications network, substituting shock for substance, rage for reason, threat for thorough assessment. In this time, we observe politicians whose material parallels the Hollywood car chases, gunfights, explosions, and mutilations of the action trash genre. Such politicians realized that the drama of political insight is much harder to achieve than the voluminous insults that draw whoops and cheers from audience members. All of these diatribes on the stump fusing into a talk television spear jammed into the side of the body politic, itself already crucified with spikes of simple-mindedness and wearing a thorny crown of omnidirectional fear and bitterness. When Buchanan walked down an Arizona street in a cowboy hat, carrying an automatic rifle horizontally held over his head with both hands, his face contorted into that smile that makes him look like an Asian mask of demonic glee, we saw the spiritual mirror of Louis Farrakhan at those times when the presence of the boss of the Nation of Islam at the center of attention and his own confidence man recognition of the imbecility behind the eyes of those looking on and all strikes the mean, mean minister himself as some cosmic joke of gargantuan proportions. Personal aside, that's something that I find very fascinating in both Buchanan and Farrakhan. Every now and then, if you look in their eyes, they kind of go like, these people are really kind of dumb, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Those people are going, yeah, go, Pat, go. And every now and then, he'll go like, <laughs> you know, every now and then, Farrakhan has that look like, well, <laughs> they can't do any better than this. I guess I might as well keep going. <laughs> you know. Uh, in the horror of the bombing of the World Trade Center by Arab extremists, and the greatest act of mass murder in American history, the Oklahoma City bombing, we are able to see two variations on the politics of rage. As Martin Perez has pointed out, the explosions at the World Trade Center detonated our traditional idea of immigrants, whether, I might add, that idea was hostile or tolerant. Previously, even if we resented them, we thought of immigrants as people who came to America for something better than what they were getting where they were born. The point was to move ahead, to take advantage of the public school system, the medical expertise, the job market, and the freedom to invent a way for yourself. Now we wonder if we might also be confronted with a large or small number of indoctrinated immigrants who see America as the great Satan and find it perfectly reasonable to consider or go about bombing, or go about committing terrorist acts that bring about death, destruction, and chaos. If the many blown to bloody shreds and parts of bodies in that federal building in, the Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City met eternity at the hands of rebel groups who feel they have a score to settle with the federal government, either getting revenge for the massacre at Waco or giving murderous form to an anger built on blaming Washington for what are thought of as satanic infringements on freedom, then we have once again felt the horror and the heartbreak wrought by some amorphous monster within, a beast whose ancestry is at least traceable back to the anarchic forces of the Natchez Traces of 200 years ago, or the various badlands that move farther and farther west where law has always, was always seen as the enemy. Well, for those of you who don't know what the Natchez Traces were, this part of Tennessee where uh, the Hart brothers ran around, and the Hart brothers had a, they were, the, they were then what we now call serial killers, because they, in those days, there weren't that many towns you could go to, so it wasn't like you could commit a crime in Philadelphia and go to uh, New York. So if you committed a crime over here, you had to go to this little bitty town over there where everybody else went. So what the Hart brothers figured was, if you commit a crime, to make sure that the people who you committed the crime against don't have to turn up and mess up your fun, then you might as well just kill everybody. So what they would do is they would rob some people, they'd kill the husband, they'd kill the wife, they'd kill all the children. 
One of them, though, happened to get caught because he decided to kill this guy, this other guy who was wanted. But in those days, they didn't necessarily take your word that you would kill a guy, so you had to bring his head with you. So I don't remember whether it was Little Harp or Big Harp, but it was one of the harps. So he killed this guy and sawed his head off and put it in a bag. And just as he was collecting his money, one of the victims of his intended serial murder, half who had survived, happened to recognize that this was one of the Hart brothers. So he came to his end there. So for those of you who didn't know what the Natchez Traces were, it was 200 years ago. So now we're kind of, we've kind of turned, we've come this 200 years and we're back in the Natchez Traces except we have better equipment. Uh, <clears throat> further, these violent immigrants and natural born Americans are truly statements of our age, where all is capable of being magnified. For whether these people arrive from outside of the country or are homegrown, they are made ominous because the nature of destructive contemporary technology is such that those with small, porous minds can surely create large, large disasters. These sorts of people and their ruthless actions also make it as hard as it has ever been for us to get beyond the surface distinctions our democratic contract is intended to supplant. This happened during the Civil Rights Movement, when the Southern accent rising off of a white person's tongue was heard at too many educated social gatherings in the North as an automatic mark of shame, a connection to social gremlins, an, inf an inflection that could rally condescension or insulting presumptions. We most recently observed this very same tendency when so many people assumed, following the World Trade Center bombing, that the Oklahoma City tragedy must surely have been the work of Middle Eastern extremists. This prejudice, given the way media influences us, is also fed by the factual actions of Hamas as it goes about its war against all Israelis, men, women, children, making no distinctions between civilians and soldiers. Yet we cannot realize ourselves within the grand scheme of our social contract if we allow attitudes toward entire groups of immigrants or native-born people to be determined by the worst actions of individuals from certain religious, geographical, and cultural categories. This pollutes our politics and our society, even when the loudest voices from those groups sometimes demand that we look at them in a special way. There can be no greater gathering of pollutants than what we have come to accept or gather to witness in our popular entertainments, from television to film, in our advertisements for clothing, for perfumes, for automobiles. As the controversy surrounding the content of popular media proves, I am far from alone in believing that such things have a debilitating effect on the spirit of the society, on race relations, on sexual trends, on manners themselves. Such material reduces what originally arrived as a kind of democratic spunk, which, which became internationally famous on the charismatic basis of its unpretentious disdain for unearned privilege and for its own expression of deadpan compassion and lyrical flippancy. We are surely surrounded at this moment by the crass combination of cynicism and whorishness that seeks to replace the stimulation of originality with the shocking affront that is either self-righteous or contemptuous, exploiting variations played to the tune of what the jazz musician Roland Kirk called volunteered slavery, stretch across our electronic means of communication, of documentation, of creating products. In other words, money is no longer seen as the root of all evil, but is now recognized as the justification for personal or collective debasement. The worst sort of capitalism, the dark world of profit in which the quality of the product is only as significant as the public is gullible. We cannot, in a time as uncivil as ours, fail to contemplate how bad manners have become and how we often find ourselves more alienated from others than we can recall because there seems no basic idea of the treatment of strangers that will allow us to feel at ease among those whom we do not know. We expect abuse in public places and often get it. 
from foul-mouthed children to excessively rude adults. An old Greek tale told by one who was perhaps a blind slave fits in this. One of the central themes of the Odyssey is how civilization reveals itself to the vulnerable stranger. With Odysseus, we recognize in situation after situation that those who are truly civilized do not take advantage of the wandering stranger and show hospitality to this new arrival. This sort of hospitality that assumes kinship seems to foreshadow the democratic legal idea that one is innocent until proven guilty. Sometimes I feel that part of our trouble in the area of civility arrives from both the horror stories of slavery that we have heard over the last 30 years and from an idea that we have seen evolve into terrible behavior since the middle 50s, which is that we prove ourselves most individual when we make sure that we don't give a damn what anybody else thinks about us. What the terrible stories of humiliation during slavery have done, it seems to me, is lead to a confusion between service and subservience, which results in people of all races giving you bad service in order to prove to you that they aren't inferior to you. I think that simplistic idea of not giving a damn, <laughs> yeah, you got bad service too, uh, yeah. You know, the one I like is when you go in a, or one of my favorite is when you go in a place and some kid is talking to another kid who's working in another store on the phone and they're gossiping about something. <laughs> You're trying to, you know, buy something. And they go, can't you see I'm on the phone? <laughs> you know, I said, gee whiz, that's another kind of job. <laughs> see, I mean, see, that's kind of, see, that's like, that's like updated decadence in the, in the workplace where you get hired to gossip with your friends on another job where somebody else is also not doing their job. Um, I think that this simplistic idea of not giving a damn is also an example of how our American pursuit of individuality and our nose-thumbing attitudes towards excessive and pretentious convention have been distorted. Moreover, this cavalier rudeness submits to the facelessness of the metropolis in which the kind of terrible behavior that we would be chastised in the small community is possible because it is so easy to disappear inside the vast population or move so swiftly as the terrible stranger from one part of town to another. We cannot forget how much sheer ignorance we are witnessing as well. These people are either too poorly educated or too naive or too willing to exhibit their low down versions of the worst upper class behavior that they are, are all the way outside of the rituals of fundamental etiquette, not having any sense of all the stages meat must go through to arrive on a fast food griddle, or how tapping rubber trees is the beginning of their Air Jordans, or what it takes to make the cotton clothes they wear, or the wool, or any tools or weapons or audio toys that result from precision engineering. These people feel that they exist on a lane set separate from everyone else, and that in that lane they can speak whatever foul words they know at whatever volumes they choose, no matter who else is around. In a certain sense, they are saying that what they do makes no difference in the larger picture, just as what they feel has no effect on the course of life either. In this mix of battered civility, we should, we should forget neither the obnoxious trash aristocracy of rock and rap nor the millionaire athletes who have replaced sportsmanship with the thin-skinned pugnaciousness of thugs playing in the street. Then there are so many who make lower-class communities in the gauntlets of perpetual threat, reminding us of what Shakespeare meant in Henry V when he wrote, and as our vineyards, fallows, meads, and hedges, defective in their natures, grow to wildness. Even so, our houses and ourselves and children have lost or do not learn for want of time the sciences that should become our country, but grow like savages, as soldiers will, that nothing do but meditate on blood, to swearing and stern looks, diffused attire, and everything that seems unnatural. 
great Google Magooga, we have a hard way to go. Part two, moving back to the outskirts of history. Since our story is about the ongoing conflict between our aspirations and our discontents, the fundamental fact of our development is essentially redefinition. We have inherited every great idea that has come out of the Western world, especially the various ways in which the New Testament rejected the tribalism of the Old Testament, laying the foundation for what was to evolve into the secular ideas of the Enlightenment when the conception of our common humanity was to slowly override all distinctions of national boundary, religion, and politics. As we know, this was seen as a rational rejection of xenophobia. The deep, imperishable condition was humanity. The rest was what we might now call cultural evening clothes for the infinite ball mask. Perhaps fanciful, elegant, or terrifying, but those cultural evening clothes are not what we recognize when the other stands naked before us. And though most of our great arguments have to do with the relationships of style, taste, and belief to results, the Enlightenment opened the way for us to understand that humanity is the essence which precedes the existence of the culturally unique. In our own democracy, an innovative sense of freedom was invented based on the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The intention was that we would be judged by our deeds, not by our backgrounds. Yet we have been long trading blows with the refinement of the tribal idea as it appears in the proposition of an aristocracy. That is because our various prejudices on the planes of race, religion, class, and sex have appeared over and over, almost always as stubborn versions of aristocratic privilege which keep us from easily realizing the grandest ideals of our democracy. This explains why our story, our evolution, is about the discontented passion that rises into action whenever our aspirations are limited by presumptions that do not hold sacred the democratic idea of no aristocracies other than those of merit. So redefinition in our nation always arrives at the point of struggle against the ideas that both deny human commonality and have been written into law determining how we relate to one another, both on the federal and the local levels. Today, right now, is a period of protean turmoil. The increasingly technological world is a merry-go-round moving at an ever faster clip, and we now seem to find ourselves only bruising or breaking our fingers if we try to snatch the brass ring. Discontent is thick in the air, but our aspirations may not really be, at least for now, up to the democratic vision that would ennoble them and further the strengths of our society. That is because our present moment is one of excessive narcissism, and exaggerated self-involvement is always at odds with democracy as a form of social order and social understanding. That narcissism shows itself in special interest groups of one distinction or another, almost all of them so hypnotized by their own mirrors that they cannot see themselves in relationship to the society at large, particularly in any way that we might find call profound. So the pace of the world, the intimidating velocity that attends the machines which we hate as much as we love, and the need for a democratic vision of interconnection or what challenge us no end. As in every dark period of history, when the sun seems to be on leave, the fog is thick as an elephant's hide, and doom grooming itself to take the society out, there are those who will tell you that they know exactly which of us are to blame for all of this and just what we should do about them. But ours is a dark period that arrives in a very unusual form. In a number of ways, we have more than we have ever had. Better health, better wages, longer lifespans, finer living conditions. But we are either cynical or angry about how poorly we have handled the demons of crime, ignorance, and prejudice. Our cities are now, locked, or are now looked upon in the popular imagination as they were by hayseeds over 100 years ago. Sodoms of violence, sexual plague, and potential catastrophe. The trend to get away, 
to move out into the suburbs has reversed the motion from the rural to the urban that historically brought so much surging vitality to each metropolis that helped define the culture and the sophistication of the country. Where the blues singer might once have sung of how the bright lights of the big city stole his baby from home, the contemporary blues of urban life weighs upon those who no longer believe in the mythic city that musicals and elegant jazz big bands made into an enormous ballroom large enough for the whole society to enter, each person bringing his or her vision of romance, of community, of effervescence. Crass concerns have taken over. Those who have made their getaways from the cities angrily worry about being taxed to support incompetent bureaucracies that never get anything of value done about the cauldron of gummy social slop that has boiled over, melting away much of what is good while scalding the sensibility into a grotesque condition. The poor of the cities believe that they and their children are cursed by the contempt and the neglect of the more fortunate. If these poor are members of so-called minorities, their gripes are connected to the raw and seamy aspects of our racial history. In the interest of truly collective problems, we notice that across the classes, our children bounce from the mass media fantasies of hedonism to those characterized by levels of violence unprecedented in their reach across the society and around the world. Our, problem now, our problems now call for a redefinition in the direction of democratic consciousness. But a consciousness that must reassert, it seems to me, the unusual combination of tragic recognition and optimism that underlay the meanings of our social contract. In the all-American skin game, I make the point that our society is organized on principles that accept the perpetual struggle between problems of power and the ideals pushed into the world by the founding fathers. Those men, because of their contempt for aristocratic privilege and because of their belief in the abilities of elected fish officials and those whom they represent, had insights into the nature of humanity as it makes itself felt in social terms. Their tragic sense was that we have to be able to reassert our ideals whenever the lower sides of humanity appear in the four forms I am sure bedevil all societies and economic structures, folly, corruption, mediocrity, and incompetence. Those lower sides have nothing to do with democracy itself. They are built mysteriously into the species. The naive among us are those who assess democracy or capitalism or both by the shortcomings of humanity itself, while failing to recognize that our social contract, our governmental structures, allow us to perpetually redress those things we find lacking. Our governmental structure allows us to redefine our aspirations when we become discontented, when we discover that something we might have thought was correct or that our predecessors might have believed was fundamentally true is found to be or thought to be all wrong. Essential to our social contract is the belief that we can eventually handle the abuses of power that we can move beyond our prejudices, that we can redeem our society by improvising into policy those ideas that we find to be true. Those ideas that take us closer and closer to our ideals and may finally go far beyond what the founding fathers themselves thought about the world. Yet the tragic consciousness founded in the perpetual possibility of readjusting our policies acknowledges that those problems would forever appear in different forms, mutating like those insects, rodents, and diseases that have gone beyond previous poisons and cures so that they can, once again, challenge the quality of our world and our health. A hindrance to our reasserting the tragic opt that, that tragic optimism comes into form as those who have entrenched themselves in one position or another make much of the prejudices of the founding fathers and of the fact that they weren't thinking about women or so-called minorities when they drew up those documents that have had such extraordinary impact on the nation and the world. This creates a dangerous kind of cynicism and disillusionment in our young. 
It is a vision that appeals to kids because of the, it is a very immature way of assessing American history, one that fails to recognize that the form of our government, as I just observed, allows us to redeem ourselves. It is because our social contract allows us to extend the human meanings of democracy beyond a single race or sex that it is of no consequence at this point what those brilliant men may have thought about the opposite sex or about people whose racial ingredients made them look somewhat different from all those bloodlines that led from all whose bloodlines led back to Europe. Their gift to this nation and the world wove together a social philosophy and a governmental form that could rediscover itself as prejudices that were once thought of as, as fact were found to be no more than superstition, which is xenophobia's foundation of fear, loathing, and condescension. What might have seemed an essentially poetic vision of humanity was actually structured in a way that would allow us to make the most of the rational as our beliefs were empirically and scientifically adjusted. It is important to always realize that we have a very special relationship to the poetic and the rational, since the conception of rights is itself a poetic thing. While the social organization of law arrived at through debate or adjusted through, or adjusted through one version or another of the amendment presumes the eventual victory of reason over limited vision. The very idea of rights moves away from the absolutes of force that we observe in the natural world, where pecking orders almost always are established by strength. The vision of rights is one of compassion and is what has led our nation to make the difficult changes that allow the weak as much access to the benefits of our society as possible. Following that, it seems to me that one of the highest points in all of Western history was the development of the abolition movement, which arrived at a time when there were none of the scientific discoveries in place that now so easily knock down racial prejudices through our knowledge of the brain, of blood, of organ transplants, and so on. In the abolitionists, we had a group of people who grew larger and larger and who were able to see more and more clearly through the superficial differences in skin color, physiognomy, and hair texture, recognizing that a portion of humanity was immorally bought and sold through the institution of bondage. In a very real way, that poetic vision of rights and of humanity anticipated scientific truth. As that movement grew, the debate over, the debate over slavery became one of the most dramatic in our history and led, finally, to the bloodiest war this nation has ever fought. The very war between the states shows us another tragic aspect of our history and proves out the fact that however much we may be committed to the rational winning out over the irrational, we must also accept the cruel truth that sometimes there's no other way to deal with the irrational outside of literal war. The killing, dismembering, wounding, and maiming of the opposition in the interest of greater freedom. It is highly doubtful that the Founding Fathers ever foresaw such a bloody conflict over the issue of slavery. But since the very existence of the United States could only arrive through those same means, it was a logical evolution of the values that, that they themselves had shared blood for. Men like George Washington knew the literal meanings of blood, sweat, and tears. They had heard the cries of battle and the cries afterward. They knew that a man who has the stomach for fighting and war may someday find himself dazed and trying to push his intestines back into his body. The road to freedom is slick and sticky with blood and flesh. A close examination of the abolition movement itself reveals that only a small group of them were actually committed to universal humanity, and that Negro Americans had to struggle within that movement for, for recognition of their entire humanity. That is but another example of how our finest ideas are not always fully appreciated by those who think that they are speaking for the best kind of social evolution. At the same time, we have to recognize, let me say this once more, 
that ideas within our nation are things that evolve on the basis of involvement and debate. We rarely have anything delivered to us in a perfect form and find our fate one that is the result of our arguing toward the richest meanings of our ideas, our pushing what might not be thoroughly thought out or thoroughly accepted towards its greatest applications, if we are lucky. That is why we find ourselves in such a mess. We are always struggling toward extending the very highest aspects of the Enlightenment. Our job is one of constantly fighting our way beyond every prejudicial sense of the world, whether they come from within or from without. This is the reason that race and sex have remained such complex problems in our society. We, we have all had to deal with the idea that white skin means something far more important than a color. We all, we all have had to deal with the idea that being born a male means, be, means more than being born a female. We have also had to deal with the variety of class prejudices that, sweep, that sweeps across the idea that quality can arrive from any class within the society. While the follies and corruptions of Marxist society <coughs> are now obvious the world over. It is also cold fact, as I say in an essay entitled Melting Down the Iron Suits of History, that, quote, we in the United States, which is the most successful commercial culture in the history of the world, maintain a running battle with the most corrupt manifestations of capitalism. American citizens are familiar with scandals involving government contracts, price fixing, insider trading, the willful sale of dangerously shoddy products, money laundering, hell for leather pollution, and the rest of it, unquote. That is one of our great virtues, that we seek out the most civilized version of capitalism, which means bringing together morality, ethics, and the profit motive. But our American story is a story of working toward an understanding of universal potential, of coming to terms with the representatives of humanity at large who find themselves players of one sort or another in the national tale, perhaps because the realization of our ideas is such a difficult job, we have forgotten exactly what our society truly means. Perhaps we have had so many failures in social policy that we are willing to sink down into this or that version of tribalism. Part three. This is, the end is coming. Wrong, this is part three. Wrong way, wretched of the earth, break down. Begins with a little quote from a book. What did Max Weber, whose definition of politics as the, as the use of power you were riffing on, say? Only those who realize how awful and self-destructive and so on people can be and still pay dues for the privilege of administering their affairs, truly have talent for politics. Something like that. Albert Murray, south to a very old place. Our politics have been influenced by our virtues as well as our tragic exemplifications of the lower inclinations of humanity. It is quite easy, therefore, to celebrate our most noble visions while denying our shortcomings. It is also easy to emphasize our shortcomings while denying our most noble traditions. All of this is the result of the fact that we all too often fail to understand the complexity of what we find ourselves in the middle of, refusing to see just how hard it is to realize a democratic sense of life in society. That is why I believe that we periodically slump into the kind of balkanized rage that expresses itself across race, sex, and class in our time. We are then retreating to a stance that falls short of a true democratic sensibility. In our time, I would say that this is a version of what Arthur Schlesinger calls the cycles of American history. In the terms of this discussion, we must look closely at those who so adamantly see themselves as outside of American privilege, that they have embraced the idea of exclusion and have created a political vision in which the majority is all wrong and the minority is all right. This is something I trace in our recent history to the emergence of black power, which spurned the, 
conceptions of the civil rights movement in the interest of a politics based on the not, of a politics not based on the achieve, achievement of equality, but one rooted in race and highly inaccurate colonial metaphors. Due to the popularity and eventual canonization of Malcolm X, there was a very strong separatist feeling in the radical air, and, dis and discussion was dominated by assertion of the Negro's alienation from America at large and the supposed fact that the Negroes shared a common fate with colonials the world over, almost all of whom were in revolt against the Western world and capitalism. I choose to investigate this aspect of our recent history because it was an essential part of what led to the ethnic and sexual narcissism that presently hampers our ability to speak to one another across categories. It is also another telling example of the difference between what Americans come to believe about themselves and what their actual history is. What the Caribbean or African colonial often feels as revealed by so much of the writing on the subject, whether fictional or polemical or both, is far removed from the American experience. The most obvious differences in the way things have shaken down are found in issues that pivot from the beginning on geographical and historical relationships to those who dominate politically and economically. The colonial knows that his or her people had essentially nothing to do with the creation of what gives uniqueness of style and attitude to the mother country, which is far, far away. The colonial provided no more than the subjugated labor that prepared the exported raw materials destined to fuel some part of the engine of modern life in the Western mother countries. No body of ideas, no technological innovations or refinements, no high position in the moral and social discourse, no deep aesthetic impact, no presence in the sense of humor, and so on. In the terms of the Negro American, the problem was very different. Negroes were not like Africans trying to take back land that had been appropriated through imperial means. They were not dislocated colonials who grew up in countries where economies, where economics rotated around a few cash crops. Negroes were central to the development of all that we consider American. As participants or representatives of issues, they had been on the front line at almost every important turning point in the history of the United States, from the true moment of colonial liberation in the Revolutionary War, to the arguments over the way slavery repudiated both democratic purity and Christian morality, to the Civil War, to the winning of the West, to the World Wars, to the evolution of a national music, a national sense of humor, a national body of dances, and a 20th century way of living in urban situations. So whenever Negroes began thinking of themselves as a black colony within the United States, within America, they hadn't had their eyes open. They had accepted a blindfold. Right now, I would say that the blindfold has been accepted by many of those in categories outside the province of race. One group after another seems to have done its own variations on black power alienation, perceiving itself whether because of its sex or its sexual preferences or its age or its class as some variation on a colony at odds with the United States, feeling good or safe or understood only within its special interest group, convinced that in a nearly conspiratorial way, either the government or the rich or the poor or the men or the women or the immigrants or the foreigners or some unknown somebody's are out there to get them, laying in wait to take almost all that they own or give them less than they deserve for sins as simple as having done a hard day's work or having lasted long enough to get some retirement benefits or having done no more than pop out of a normally or artificially inseminated womb on American soil. So many have accepted the blindfold. In fact, that we, so many have accepted the blindfold, in fact, that we are back to the blind feeling up the elephant, the donkey, and the marketplace. 
Almost every shape that they touch either frightens them or seems much less than they were promised by politicians since the end of World War II. It is sometimes hot where they expected it to be cold, rough where they thought it smooth, sharp where they figured on something that wouldn't cut, and so on. Where they wanted the sensation of paradise, these knotting their own blindfolds ever tighter, find themselves mad as hell and tired of being misled. As Robert J. Samuelson observes in The Good Life and its, and its Discontents, The American Dream in the Age of Entitlement, 1945 to 1995, such people suffer from what he calls, quote, the politics of overpromise, unquote. This brings us to my conclusion, which is based in the need for a reiteration of the tragic optimism I earlier described as basic to our social contract, our form through which we do our best against folly, corruption, mediocrity, and incompetence. I believe that the reiteration of that feeling and understanding is the mark to which our politicians have to rise. In what George Will calls, quote, our therapeutic culture, unquote, reiterating that vision is far from easy to bring off primarily because we believe that through either humiliating ourselves publicly or giving vent to our true feelings, we will be on the road to health, or at least on the way to the pharmacy with the right prescription. The various strains of anger and xenophobia that we find in just about every place we travel to in our land are not unreal. They are misguided and they are vented either loudly or in whispers. Many of these strains are the results of having been given the impression that someday life was going to be a crystal stair leading to some sort of utopia, which is another point Robert J. Samuelson makes. But the conception of a utopia is a conception that has no time for tragic facts and is a revolt against the harsh and unpredictable nature of the world. On one front, we are susceptible to utopian thinking because our quite successful way of handling so many threats to our lives has reduced a good number of the kinds of deaths that were normal before the arrival of penicillin and other wonder drugs. I'm talking about the way it was when large families often expected the deaths when pictures of the coffin business almost always included stacks of small ones that seem not much larger than lunch pails. These are the kinds of developments in human health and every other arena of comfort we now take for granted that have set us up as chumps ready to wallow in a cult of belief, anxious to follow whomever will most passionately guarantee us that we will make it to heaven on earth. Heaven, of course, is nowhere to be found. We just happen to have gotten closer as a nation than any other country in history. I do not believe that we can handle our problems of race, class, sex, the environment, and so on until we accept our limitations and understand that there are problems that will not be finished at the same velocity that information presently travels through our technology. As Senator Moynihan said a few years ago about our social ills, it took us 30 years to get into this mess, and it will probably take us 30 years to get out of it. We should take heed of this observation, however daunting it might seem to those in a rush to get every crimp immediately straightened. The story of life is always the tale of the journey from a revelatory conception to the execution of the idea, which may be short this time, long the next. As members of an improvising democracy, we might do better to shape our vision on the form of the soap opera not the sound bite. However melodramatic, the soap opera makes it clear that problems go on and on and on. We are in a time when we have to redefine our aspirations and discover when our discontents are rational and when they are not. It is perhaps most necessary that we have leaders, regardless of party, regardless of right, middle, or left, who have the patience and the courage and the eloquence to come forward with a convincing sense of humanity that will allow us to acknowledge ourselves 
not only as what we are, but as what we can be. Adults, fully aware of how fundamental human shortcomings and mistakes are to all eras. But are people ready to face the lumps that we must take in order to get as much of this stuff right as we can? Such leadership, from the local to the national level, should eventually draw those disengaged millions back into the political process. One never knows. As ever, our society is one everybody on the face of the earth follows. Our story. As ever, our story is one every, everybody on the face of the earth follows. Our society has been the dark horse, and it has been the triple crown winner. Perhaps that is how we have to see ourselves, as democratic jockeys moving in and out of the light with our mounts, winning, losing, improvising, learning, making great jumps, taking horrible falls, but always refusing to give an ear to anything less than the tragic optimism of the blues to be redefined. Thank you. It's not really that hot up here. I have typhoid. Uh, questions, questions. I'll take. I'll take a few questions. Oh, this is the perfect kind of audience. No questions. Oh, oh yes, yes, I see you. Yes. Oh, well, they all should go to jail. Uh, the little crooks, the big crooks, the black crooks, the white crooks, those who have the skin tone in between, they break the law. There should be, um, I think that there should also be a parity of uh, sentencing, that is, I mean, we know it's like, say, for instance, if you and I were working on Wall Street, we still say $300 million, right? Uh, and we invested in a way that we're able to take profit from the $300 million and put it over here. So when they finally find out that we stole the $300 million, we've got it somewhere else. So if they were to confiscate it, then we'd still have our profits over here. Now. We might go to jail for two years, if that long. Um, whereas if you and I went in, got a couple of pistols, and went into the nearest chemical bank and said, stick them up, and left with, say, something happened, and we couldn't get this going, and people panicked and went crazy, and we went, didn't really intend to shoot anybody, so we ended up running out of the door with a bag with $1,200 in it, right? We might go to jail for 10 years. Now, I don't know whether the question is $300 million or pistols. That is, it seems that if you, if you steal money with a word processor or a telephone or a contract, that somehow you should get less time than if you didn't go, than if you pull a gun on somebody. My feeling is that it, it's not good for the society for people to have that disparity of sentences. You know, in other words, like a guy like Michael Milken, as far as I'm concerned, he should still be in jail. You know, Ivan Bolsky, those kind of guys. Uh, uh, I have a friend on Wall Street, I asked him, I said, well, what do you think would, uh, would reduce this kind of thing? He said, well, time. He said, he, said, he said, don't you think if a guy, you know, he said, if a guy steals $200 million and you tell him 
He's got to go to jail for two years. He says, 100 million a year, that's not bad. You know, he says, so he steals 300 million, so he stays there three years. He said, 100 still, still 100 million dollars a year. He said, but if you put him in jail for 25 years with no possibility of parole, he said, those kind of punk guys that are on Wall Street, they're not going to do that then. I mean, what, what this man? The guy, who, the guy like Milken, who's really that much smarter than other people, he probably would still do it. He'd take the risk. But when people saw him take that kind of fall, it might have a big effect. You know? uh, but I think that we, that uh, personally, I think if, if, if crack is the subject, I think they should legalize drugs. The reason why I think drugs should be legalized is to see at this point in time, drugs fuel the criminal economy. So that if, say, these people in this row and I decided we wanted to start a hot car ring, so we we're going to sell steel cars in New York, steel cars in New York and in Pennsylvania, and send them down to South, to Mexico, to the Caribbean, and to South America. But we needed, say, two hundred thousand dollars to get it going. You know, so we could get a place and steal a car. We hire people to steal the cars. We have to get a garage somewhere. We have to get a big truck that you could have the car hidden inside of, et cetera. Hook up your stuff, get it on a boat, all of that. So, I mean, if we wanted to really get that $200,000, we'd probably go into selling drugs. And I mean, almost every form of crime right now that's not about drugs, if you come into it and you want the money to, to, to to make that, to bring that off, you sell drugs. Besides, you see, I don't think that, I, my feeling about human beings is that, um, you know, people, you know, people like sensation, but you know, most people will say, well, you know, I, you know, if you had all the dope out there, they say, yeah, well, heroin is good, or cocaine, or blah, but you know, I do have to pay my rent, you know. I have to send my kids to school. I have to buy clothes. It's like people do with alcohol, you know. And uh, because I don't think, because the amount of money that people in the drug trade are able to pay people to work for them is so large that you will never discourage it unless you just went into martial law or something. And I don't think that the United States can handle what you really would have to do to have a serious war on crime. You know, I mean, uh, uh, so I just think they should just do it and, you know, the kind of people who become addicts are the same kind of people who become, you know, alcoholics or the same kind of people who lose their houses and cars and everything going to Atlantic City. I mean, that's a, that's a specific kind of person. I don't, in other words, I don't think that if they legalize drugs that everybody in this room a week later would be walking around a heroin addict. I, just, I can't see that. You know, yes, sir. Well, I blame that on the media uh, to a very large extent because uh, I talked to a lot of lawyers and judges about the Simpson case. And, and uh, every one of them said that if you have a, if the prosecution has a star witness who's a cop who is involved in the discovery of a major piece of evidence and is found to be caught lying on the witness stand, you lose the case. There's nothing to do with race. You lose the case because the jury assumes that in theory there's supposed to be one criminal in the court, the defendant. You know? Now, what I mean is this is a basic thing. I talked to many you know, prosecutors and talked to Marlon about it some a month and a half ago or so. I met a guy who's a prosecutor in the Bronx, which I mean, see, you always lose like that. It doesn't have anything to do with, with race. Now, what I mean when I say I blame the media is, and I, and I logged probably as many hours as the average person did who was involved in following that case. And that was never, that, 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 that point was not a basic part of the discussion after the verdict. It was kind of like, well, is this the black people? Are they, uh, is this jury nullification? Or 
This the white, black, blah, blah. You know, see, that's just newspaper people. You know, Geraldo Rivera, you know, that kind of, you know, you get those kind of hysterics. You give them a job in five nights on TV, and they get more hysterical by the night. You know, like I used to watch, I'd watch him. I, I wanted to figure out if he was going to pass out, you know, in the middle of one of his diatribes. Because one time he got to one, when Johnny Cochran, when Johnny Cochran um, um, committed that copyright infringement for using the Holocaust as a, me a metaphor, that night, Geraldo Rivera started crying. He said, there's a Jewish person. I said, wait a minute, man. What? You know what I mean? He said, well, he, I, didn't, I, don't, did he got, I think he forgot what he was. I think he was, for a minute he was part Jewish, then he started crying, and then he was Jewish, Jewish. Then after a while, he was just crying on TV. But uh, when I was saying, boy, it's hard, it's, it's, boy, it's a hard time for a metaphor out here in this country, you know? And uh, for all of this time, you know, every now and then you see somewhere one of the lawyers, what I mean is one of the, a lawyer for a split second would make that point. But it wasn't a point that became so basic to the national understanding that people were able to see the verdict in terms of how verdicts take place, whether you have a black defendant, a black victim, a black jury, a white jury, a white defendant, et cetera. The thing I thought that was most important about the trial, though, was that, that it showed in many ways how, how much the country has changed over, say, the last 35 years. Um, if a parallel case had taken place, say, in 1960, say, in um, San Francisco, and say, say it had been that... Uh, uh, Willie Mays was accused of having a white mistress in San Rafael, whom he became very possessive of, and he was accused of killing her, right? Um, you would have he would have had a white lawyer, there would have been a white judge, there would have been a white prosecution, and there would probably would have been a white jury. And those in the media who would have commented on it would have all been white guys in those kind of suits that those guys wore at that time. I mean, you see them, you know, you, you see when they see the Kennedy era, the first thing you say is, gee, those suits those guys wore. Uh, and um, that would have been it. You wouldn't have had, you know, like, a, you know, black lawyers and Jewish lawyers and, and uh, uh, F. Lee Bailey, probably Irish. Uh, you wouldn't, that wouldn't have been his team. You wouldn't have had uh, uh, Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden and so on. You definitely, the odds of you having a, a Japanese American judge who had been an Eagle Scout and whose parents had been in, in one of the relocation centers, that wouldn't have happened. And you, and you wouldn't have had people of all these different racial backgrounds and stuff involved in the gigantic media assessment from station to station of the thing. So even though uh, a great deal of uh, hostility and complexity and uh, of co complex hostility resulted from the trial, I think that when we look at the trial itself and this incredible uh, 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 parade of, of Americana in terms of all of the different people who were there, I mean, you know, you, got, you had everything from Cato Kalin, who was purely a man of our time, you know, if you, if you, I mean, if you, you, know, if you turn on AMC and you look at those old movies, you will find no one like him in there. You know, I mean, he's like a, he's real, he's all, he's as real for our time as people like Edward G. Robinson and Humphrey Bogart and James Cagney and those people were when they appeared, you know. Smell. No, not you, her. You're next.
Oh, I don't know if it's quite that. Uh, it's that the, um, well, I don't think that's true. I mean, you know, um, I mean, look, tonight, like say you were some uh, interested young student who had your two and a half year old daughter with you who's asleep on the chair. And these guys who do these do this terrible repairs of the New York streets and stuff are out there on Lexington Avenue. They've got a big hole that goes way down somewhere. And something happens when you go and you trip on the steps and you bump into your daughter and your daughter falls down the hole, right? Okay. Everybody in New York, everybody in Philadelphia, Chicago, I mean, they'll have all kinds of people here. They'll be looking for, you know, it'll become a big national event like the girl that fell out of that hole in Texas, you know, and then everybody will be thrilled when she gets pulled out of it. I don't see, see, I, 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 in other words, I think that I don't think people aren't interested in other people. I think that the that the problem is, or one of the problems, one of our many problems, is that um, we haven't uh, we have mishandled a lot of things. For instance, the poverty program did some good, but it could have done a lot more good. The reason it didn't do more good was because it became what you always get in politics if you're not extraordinarily vigilant, which is it became part, it became another big slab of meat in the patronage grinder that these guys dole out to the people who support them getting in office. Now this happened across the country. And so when people say, well, the poverty program, we spent all this money, but that, you know, but a lot of that money didn't get where it was supposed to go. And um, I think also we have, well, for instance, the thing you were talking about, I've been thinking about that petroleum business, the oil stuff for a long time, but you see, that could get changed like that. That is, like, say 10 years from now, say if the Chinese have capital, which they probably will have in 10 years, they don't have much money now, but 10 years they'll probably have money. Uh, say they turn around and, <laughs> and say to the Japanese and the Germans and Detroit, they say, look, we have serious pollution problem, which they have right now. We want automobiles, got a market, maybe 200 million cars, because by the end, what, it'll probably be 1.5 billion. So we say, well, we got a market, 200 million cars, but people will buy them. That'd be the end of petroleum that day. They said, we don't want cars that, that burn gasoline. Do you think that the Japanese or the Germans or the people in Detroit would turn their backs on a market that big to support the guys in the oil industry? They would not, you know. So it's, you, you never know. See, a lot of things turn, turn out for the good just because they're better business for somebody, you know. Uh, I think, though, that, that uh, more and more people are going to make environmental concern something that, that um, uh, politicians are not gonna really be able to duck. But of course, you always have, you know, you, but then you have that other thing which you always get in the United States, which is these obsessive nuts connected to issues. You know, that is, if you find out that there's some kind of an insect that's this big, right, that exists somewhere in some woods or something, and some guy who's become obsessed with insects finds out that there's something going on, you know, in the way somebody does business that will just that will make this insect disappear from the earth forever. That particular person, if if he or she is sufficiently <laughs> eloquent might end up having a thousand people there saying, save the insect this big. Now that's the truth about the United States. You know, that is, is that anything you can think of that's good, somebody in this country can get, get a whole group of people and completely pervert the meaning of it. You know, so that half the time the issue becomes, becomes confused by the nut element in the United States, 
that always attaches itself to anything. And see, I think that, that, that a lot of what happens is, is that we end up wasting a lot of time on, on important things because we get distracted so much by lunatics. You know, it's just like the abortion thing. See, I never would have thought that a guy, I'd ever see a guy get it up in court and say, I think I should have shot the doctor for doing that. It's like, what? You know what I mean? I mean, when you can get all the way to that, to the guy like Sanctimonious, he says, yeah, I did it. I'd do it again. Let me out today. I'll shoot another doctor. I was like, well, uh, he's not a guy that the average lawyer would have expected to have as a client. You know, because very rarely does a lawyer get a client who says, yes, I'm ready to go to the witness stand and say I did it. He said, no, 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 that's not how this works out here. You know, fine, you've told me that, you're my client. You don't tell the judge, you don't tell the jury, you know. And so, so we have every issue that we have is like that. You know, you have a fool like Louis Farrakhan who's like completely, he's like, um, he's like, you know, he's like intellectual tear gas. You know what I mean? It's like he runs you out of the room. You know, you're meeting to talk about something important and he opens the canvas and says, I got the solution. And everybody goes, <coughs> you run, you know what I mean? You know, you got him. You like know, said, and you got, like I said, this guy, like this guy Buchanan. I mean, that's, I, in 1996, Pat Buchanan, I mean, and so, Half of our time is spent trying to just get, you know, open the windows and get the tear gas out, get the bouncer to throw these fools out, get these obsessives, send them to the basement, let them, you know, measure the size of the walls or something. That's the problem that we have. And that's just the nature of freedom and that's what you get in a free society. I mean, I like it, but, but that's just the process. And even the talk bill saw that that, 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 that that's why it takes a long time to get stuff. You know, that's what I meant earlier when I said that, that, the, that, 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 the hit, that, that the history of the world is always about the distance between the revelatory conception and its execution. Sometimes it's a short period. Other times it's long, you know. And what we have to do as Americans is accept the difficulty without losing you know, losing faith in, 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 in maintaining focus on the things that we do know are important. Yes, sir. Oh, you mean of the Republicans? Well, you know, um, um, At, the, at this moment, I like what Bill Clinton is doing, primarily because he, appropri he appropriates whatever he thinks the public wants. So that in other words, he come, went in one way, and you know, so Bill Bennett and, and C. Dolores Tucker and these people start ranting and raving about the media and stuff. He said, oh, okay, and people say, yeah. Right. So he says, gets the people in Hollywood, I want you all to come. I want all you all to come down to Washington, D.C. Now, that was done before, um, a little over 60 years ago, um, J except I think J. Edgar Hoover went to Hollywood. What happened was, was that the, the, the movies with James Cagney and these guys in them made the criminals so charismatic and the, and, the, and the cops seemed like such dullards that Hoover went out there and said, well, no, wait a minute, <laughs> you all, <laughs> this is not very good for the society. I mean, these people do run around and rob banks and kill people. You can't make them seem like, you know, tragic heroes or something. That's the reason why James Cagney went from being a criminal in one movie to the next movie. He was starring in a movie called G-Men. And then, and so they took him, they said, well, the best solution to that is make him a cop. Because you actually, a guy this charismatic, you're not gonna be able to get another guy in a movie who plays a cop and is gonna beat him out. So if you wanna do it, you do it the other way. I like that, what he's doing. And I like the way that um, 
Um, he took the role, you know, slowly, but did take the role of leadership in the Bosnia situation, and you know, essentially used, for, you know, put force in there. As a, see, because I don't see personally, like I said earlier in the piece. Sometimes, in the interest of good, you just have to be prepared to kill people. That's just the way it is. I'm sorry, that may not sound nice, but it's just like a guy like Adolf Hitler. They tried taking him to tea. They tried writing him letters. They tried talking to him on the phone. They tried, hey, Adolf, come on, man. You know, calm down. Oh, yeah, right. But what would you like? Well, I'd like Austria for breakfast, Czechoslovakia for lunch, and Poland for dinner. So, well, no, you can't have Poland for dinner, but you can have Austria for, for breakfast and Czechoslovakia for lunch. And, he's, and then he calls you back on the phone and says, you know, I'm still hungry. Now, see, people like that, it's only one thing you can do, fire and steal. I feel the same way, you know, like I hear people tell me, they say, well, I'm opposed to war. I said, I'm not opposed to war. I said, you actually think that those people in the South were going to just let those slaves run off one day? They were just going to get up on the porch one day and say, I want all y'all to come out of here. I want to tell you all something. I had a vision last night, and I decided I'm giving every one of you $500, a horse, and a map of Pennsylvania. <laughs> no. No. They weren't going to do that. They weren't going to give that up. So, you know, like, like I always have great, like when I'm reading about Sherman and, and, uh, and Grant and Phil Sheridan and those people like really <laughs> stomping the South, I enjoy that. <laughs> I enjoy that. And, uh, and when I read about, you know, Oh, when the high command told Hitler, <laughs> don't go in there. I mean, when he wanted to go in Russia, he said, don't go in there. I enjoy reading about the complete destruction of the German army by the Russians. I like that. I like that, you know, because I wouldn't have wanted them to win. I wouldn't have wanted them to win because I didn't like Louis Armstrong. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Right. Right. Well, let me answer the second one first. See, the, um, the biggest problem that uh, totalitarian regimes ever have is the idea that the world can go another way than the way it is presently going. Now, we might not like the idea that this totalitarian situation may be changed coming in the back door rather than the front door. That is, that once, well, we do know this, that a lot of this stuff that happened in Tiananmen Square was the result of all of those Chinese students who had come and gotten education in the, in the Western world, and then they went back and they said, hey, remember this? This is incorrect. Uh, I think that I think that the Chinese, because nobody now can really keep information out, they can't really keep information out. Because a guy, like for instance, a guy told me, a, 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 a black guy who worked in television told me that he went to, a, he went to Russia some 30 years ago to talk to this 
this uh, 30, 30, maybe 35 years ago, to talk to this black guy who had defected during the McCarthy era and was living in this little bitty apartment in Moscow, I think it was. And he had this little tinny, these little tinny speakers and a turntable. And when this guy, when this guy who was working for CBS or something came in, he said, he put on one of his records, right? And played them through his little tinny speakers and showed him his view out of his window of a wall or something and said, um, now you see this kind of stuff that we have over here as a result of the government that, that Negroes don't have in the United States? You know what I'm saying? Now, see, you can't do that now. You can't do that now. So I think that they'll fall. I think, that I, I think it'll fall. I think it's going to fall from, I think it's going to fall just from the weight of the information about the rest of the world. You know, and um, I don't think it's necessarily going to be violent, though. I don't think it's necessarily going to be violent. I think it's just going to erode. You know, that's what I think is going to happen with China. Now, to close out, um, what I mean by the tragic optimism is that um, that the that 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 in that what blues essentially does is it takes the position that we have to look at and accept the reality of the harshness of life, but we seek out in the in the way the blues is played through its lyricism. That we that, that that's an expression of the ongoing concern for human, for 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 better situations, but but not better but not perfect better situations because no blues singer would ever tell you that it's going to be perfect. Thank you. I have to go. Glad to say. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs please visit us at 92ny.org.